we are on lesson number 14 and uh, we are continuing tonight with um, uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation and this is um, again focus on prophecy. I, I, I don't know about you but I remember since I was very young I used to to read a lot of books and there are like series, very short books on detective work and crime, solving crimes and stuff like that. And I think that some of the um, most popular literature, fiction, fictional literature today still remains that. And I, I, I was intrigued by the title of today's lesson, Conspiracy to Murder. <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's in the same line of, you know, um, this is it, it, this is news. This is something that uh, uh, you know is popular, and many people seem to be very interested in this kind of topics. But I would suggest to you that what we are dealing with tonight is the real thing, and I think that this is at the heart of 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 the entire lesson and all the lessons that we do and the entire series. It's at the heart of the scriptures. Um, Conspiracy to murder, I would call it the great controversy and the great conflict between good and evil. And I think that if we understand this lesson, if we understand this theme, I think that everything else will, will make more sense. So I'm going to go to the first slide as we usually do. And we are familiar with this slide. Again, the whole idea is the focus is we, uh, what we study here is for our teaching. It's for our instruction. We live in critical times, and it is so important that we understand uh, what, what, why we study what we study. It's relevant to us. Revelation chapter 12 uh, shows us, because if we look again at the title, you know, Conspiracy to Murder, Revelation 12 shows us who really lies behind all the crime and cruelty in, in, in our world. I think this is... It comes from the lesson, and I think it's quite a powerful statement because it makes a very um, important uh, point here. I, I, I believe, and I've said this many times, many people have, and I say intentionally, many people have a problem with the idea of God and uh, the reality of God or accepting the reality, the existence of God, because they can't really make sense how a God that is preached, um, a God of love, a, a God of compassion, a, a God of patience, could allow all the evil that's happening in the world. And uh, there is a story uh, in our lesson for those who studied it. And I know that sometimes, you know, we, we live in, in critical times and sometimes people tend to stay away from certain things just to be politically, politically correct. But I think that the story here is quite, uh, quite interesting and it's, it's part of our history, the history of the world. And this is the story of the Romanov family and how, um, you know, when, when communism um, came to power in Russia, this family had to flee and how the entire family was executed. And um, there's a statement here, the assassination of the Romanovs was one of the more shocking crimes of the 20th century. And then at the end of the story, I don't want to go into too much detail. I think that most of us are familiar with the story. Uh, we read this because you see, it, it crime, it, we, we cannot really make sense of it. It's, it's very hard to accept when um, senseless we would call it senseless evil takes place. There's always sense behind it. And tonight we're going to go to the heart of it. Um, we, we can't really make sense of it unless we have, and, and we peer, we have a look and we peer behind the scenes. And that's exactly what happens as far as Revelation chapter 12 is concerned. But now the lesson takes a very interesting approach. Because the lesson here, and I'm, I'm going to read this if you, if you don't mind. Um, the lesson gives us an overview of the chapter before going into the chapter. And I felt that it was, it was beautifully put together. And I just want to read it from, from our lesson. It says here, first in, in chapter 12, chapter 12, again, Revelation chapter 12, the book of Revelation is full of symbolism. 
And as I did last week, I'm going to do the same this week in, in this lesson. I don't want us to get bogged down by every single detail and try and look be, you know, at what every single word could, may symbolize, unless we have direct references in the scriptures. What I'm interested in is just to keep it as simple as possible, as clear as possible, and to get the, you know, the, the main message of this chapter. So here in chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, this is the, the, the background, the picture that is given. First, we see a mother projected up into the sky, a woman, I'm on page three, projected up into the sky as on a giant movie screen. And I like how the authors of these lessons are trying to you know, contextualize or, or make it uh, speak our own language when it comes to presenting this lesson. The sun, moon, and stars surround her, reflecting the light of her beauty. She's crying out in labor, about to give birth. Satan appears, disguised as a seven-headed dragon. He hopes to play midwife at this all-important birth so he can snuff out the life of the child. The baby is born. Miraculously, the child is snatched from the clutches of the dragon and carried to God's throne and his protection. Satan is furious and attacks the mother. She finds a place of safety prepared for her by God, but then Satan goes after her remaining children. Some survive his attacks. Others are wounded or killed. In the end, however, the mother and her surviving children spend eternity with Jesus. So I, I, I think it's so beautiful because now it, it gives you a preview of, of the entire chapter. And it's in very simple language, very nicely put together. All right, so there's the mother, she's pregnant, she's about to give birth, but then there's Satan depicted as, you know, evil, the evil one depicted as a dragon with seven heads, and he's trying to take the child away from the mother as she gives birth. He wants to destroy the child, and the only thing that is not said here, but we're going to come to this, this is Jesus, this is the Messiah, this is the means by which God wants to save the world, and... Um, then, you know, the, the child is saved, but then the, the, the Satan is, is angry that he failed in his attempt to destroy the Messiah, and then he wants, to, uh, he wants to attack the mother, and he wants to attack the other children. We'll see who the other children are. But in the end, all ends well, and uh, the mother and her surviving children spend eternity with Jesus. We could even say, okay, amen, that's it. <laughs> this is Revelation chapter 12. But no, uh, the lesson starts like this, but then we unpack it. And I like it because it, it, it gives us, this is the context, this is the picture. And so that we don't misunderstand anything, this is the setting. Now, the woman, the mother, represents the pure church of God. And the reference is 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. We don't have time now to go into reading all the passages, but you have it in the lesson. It is here on the screen as well. So the woman, uh, in, 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 in um, biblical symbolism, we'll see that uh, there are two women. I mean, women, a woman can represent a nation. In this particular case, it represents the church of God or those who follow Christ. There is also another woman, but we're going to come to that when we study further in the book of Revelation. The baby represents Jesus, Matthew chapters 1 and 2. It's just uh, and only very few references here. There could be more references that we could give. So you, we have the woman, and this is the church, but in the sense, you know, across uh, from biblical times uh, into uh, all the way up to our time, that's God's faithful, if you want. So to just use a very simple uh, term that, brings everybody together that's the church and now you have because when jesus was born the church wasn't there again we're dealing with symbolism here um, and those who were called by god to preach the coming of the messiah those who were called by god to or those who have accepted god's call to maintain the relationship with divinity as he intended it from the beginning from creation they are part of this of the symbolism, all right? And through the uh, chosen nation, Israel, but then also uh, by implication through the church, Jesus comes into the picture. The dragon is re represents Satan. Revelation 12 verse 9 very clearly spells it out. We're going to come to that. And the children who 
who are left represent the followers of Jesus. And this is very important because here you and I find our own place. So in Revelation 12, 17, we'll come to that as well. The children who are left represent those. So after the coming of Jesus Christ, the church is founded as we understand church. And then everyone who was a follower of Christ after the coming of Christ, everyone who remained faithful to the gospel, everyone who remained faithful to God, the true followers of, of Jesus are represented by the children who are left. Okay? So now I would like us to go through the... Uh, through the chapter. You know, it's not a very long chapter, but I'd like us to go through it. And from time to time, I may make reference to, to the lesson as well, because again, I'm saying it again, what we're trying to do here is to make sure that we understand the main aspects of the lessons. All right? Not all the little details, but we're going to focus on some of that. So Revelation 12 speaks about the woman and the dragon. And again, which is interesting is that there's a lot of duplicity, not duplicity, it's, it's it, it, duplicity maybe is the wrong word, repetition, let's use this word, repetition. Because again, here, we're going to revisit themes that we've seen in previous chapters in the book of Revelation, and also uh, passages and chapters from the book of Daniel, right? So there's an overlapping of... Um, time periods, there's a reference again to things that we've discussed before. And this is, I'm saying it again, I said it last time, it's by means of affirmation and confirmation, all right? You didn't get it wrong. Yes, this is interpreted in the right way. When we speak about that 1,260 days that we've discussed before, it comes up again, it is repeated, it's contextualized. The events that are taking place are being contextualized. So, from verse 1, and a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman, and we've explained now what the symbolism is, what the woman represents, a pure church in this particular case, because there's going to be also a scarlet woman, there's going to be, you know, dressed in scarlet, and she's called something else. We'll come to that later on. But we have this woman who is clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So there's light Surrounding, uh, surrounding her. And light is always symbol of, you know, of truth, of, of truthfulness, and of purity. Why, why, why are we saying that? You see, if, if you go into a room that's dark and you look for something, unless you know where that thing is, you are going to, you know, blindly look for, for that thing. And the chances of you find something that you've misplaced in the dark are very, very uh, slim. The moment you switch on the light, then everything is revealed, and you can see clearly. All right? It's not on the table, it's not on the couch, it's, a, oh, it's on the carpet. All right? So light brings about clarity. Light is good. Darkness is not good. And this woman represents, as we said before, and we use this word, the pure church. Church where there is light, where there is truth. Where, where the gospel is preached in its purity without being, um, uh, you know, without error. Verse 2, she was pregnant and was crying, uh, crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, so here we have the pregnant woman. So now this is the time before the second coming of Jesus Christ. It was a difficult time. Uh, we can interpret the crying uh, in different ways, you know, the agony of giving birth. Jesus came at a very, very difficult time in the history of Israel. They were, you know, under Roman occupation, and uh, but prophecy pointed towards him, his coming. Also, if you want, we can go to the actual story of Mary. Now, this passage is not talking about uh, Mary, the mother of God. But if we look at her circumstances, you know, they, she also gave birth under very, very difficult uh, circumstances. There was no place in any hotel or inn uh, at that time. And uh, she gave birth surrounded by animals. That must have been an agonizing experience. Uh, 
So we have the woman, and then number three, verse three, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, seven heads and ten horns. This is about power. Again, completeness of power and uh, absolute control from, from this perspective. And on his head, seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the, to the earth. We are going to come to this. So again, Revelation 12 speaks about the great controversy between good and evil, which is portrayed here by the woman and the dragon, all right? Revelation 12 is not the only chapter where this is clearly spelled out. There are two other passages in the Bible in specifically. We're going to come back to that a little bit later on, and we're going to talk about Ezekiel and Isaiah. We, we don't have time to read it, but in those two passages, it's, it's exactly the same setting from a prophetic, exp- uh, uh, from a, a prophetic uh, perspective. Now, stars here represent, you know, looking within the context of the whole story, uh, the angels. And the idea is that there was, we'll see a conflict But the dragon managed to bring to his side a third of the angels. I'm just saying it now. We're going to come back to it a little bit later on. But we'll we'll revisit this. So a third. Now, Some scholars say, was it necessarily, I mean, let's say there were, I don't know how many billion angels and exactly one third of them. Is this one third symbolic? Uh, we, I wouldn't really get stuck on that, but a, you know, a large number of unfallen beings that were worshiping God uh, were somehow convinced by the rhetoric of the devil, and they got to his side. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Right? So he wanted to destroy. Jesus is symbolized by the child, the Messiah, is, is, is uh, sorry, the child symbolizes Jesus, the Messiah. And again, if we go to history and if we remember the story of Jesus' birth, and that's why we're given as reference Matthew 1, Matthew 2, we can go to other passages as well. Uh, when Jesus was born, now the, the, the wise man from the East who came to um, worship and to bow before before Jesus and to bring him gifts because they studied the skies and they studied, you know, ancient prophecies and, and stories. And they came to the realization that something amazing, an amazing king was going to be born. So they went to find this king and the star led them to, um, to Bethlehem. We know the, the Christmas story. All right. And um, when they, they, they first went to the king, Herod, Say, so, wow, you know, we, we heard there's, there's, there's a king that is going to soon be born. And Herod said, what are you talking about? You know, and of course, he didn't want any competition. And he said, if you, if you, you know, as soon as you find him, please come back and tell me because I want to worship him. And uh, the wise men went and they found Jesus, baby Jesus. But then in a dream, they were told, don't go back and don't tell the king because he doesn't have good intentions. So they didn't do it. And Herod desired, so, so desperately wanted to kill the child that he actually gave an order to kill all children or babies under two, just to make sure that that child will also be destroyed. And it was very similar to what happened in Moses' time. So the devil tried to destroy, to devour the baby as he was born. Now, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all nations with the rod of iron. The symbolism there, but again, we don't, it's already 25 past. We don't have time to go into all the details. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So through Jesus' ministry, all Jesus died on the cross. He was resurrected and he went to the Father. So after Christ's ascension, the woman then had to flee into the wilderness. And this is the time period where, you know, uh, Christianity, if you want, uh, the true followers of Christ, and I, I say this intentionally, uh, went through a very difficult time. And this is what it speaks again, again about the 1,260 days 
this is AD 538 when, you know, um, Rome, the, the king, the, the emperor at the time just decided I'm not just an emperor, I'm not just a soldier, I'm a theologian now. So it became from being solely a political power to a religious power and all the way to the end of the French Revolution, the beginning and in the period of the French Revolution. So that's when we have the 1,260 days. And this is a, a, a difficult time of persecution and challenges for, for the church. All right. So more or less, this is the first part. This is the setting of the story. Um, then uh, that, that was battle number one, as it is presented in, in, uh, in our lesson. And then from Revelation 7 to verse, uh, Revelation uh, 12, verses 7 to 12, we have what, the, what the, the lesson calls battle number two, right? And this is the part, this is the passage that I alluded to, and I want to just bring to your attention here, the, the two uh, other passages that speak about this war that arose in heaven. So it's very interesting the way it is presented. We have the story of, of uh, the birth of Jesus and then what happened with the church after Christ's resur uh, death, resurrection, and ascension. But then it gives the prequel, right? What happened before that? <laughs> and as you can see, it's not done just in movies. Sometimes, you know, a lot of people like, like Star Wars and my son is, is, is so much into it. He's 16 and now he went and got himself some Lego to build against Star Wars, you know, a, a, sheep, a, a ship. And um, I, it's, it's interesting, but what I always found difficult to follow in Star Wars was that there is always a prequel. You know, you have the story and then it shows you what happened before. Now, to me, it makes more sense to show me the story now and then this is what happened afterwards and this is what happened afterwards. Now, here in Revelation 12, we have a similar thing. So we have the story as far as the woman is concerned, the birth of the Messiah, and then, you know, uh, the persecution of the church. But let's see what happened first. How did this all start? And in verse 7, and it's interesting because the, the, the word that, that connects the first battle with the second is now. It was actually now as in, in that time, right at the beginning, war arose in heaven. And Ezekiel 28, please, if you have time tonight, if you have time, look at Ezekiel 28, especially verses 15 to 19, and Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 15. And Isaiah it even speaks about the reason why this whole thing happened and how actually sin came to be, you know, what happened in Lucifer's uh, heart and how he desired to be higher than the Most High, to take God's place. Uh, most scholars, when uh, they look at the word war, you know, what kind of war was it? And there are all kinds of depictions. I just chose this one of them. It, it's actually very artistic. If you look closely, there's fish involved and butterflies. But just as, <laughs> it's, it's a portrayal of somehow this battle of good and evil between, you know, Michael and the dragon. And throughout the history, there, there, there have been so many stories and art and that I think has misrepresented the whole idea that's actually in the scriptures. But most scholars say that this war is not, wasn't necessarily a physical battle. It was a battle of ideas, a battle of, of arguments. And the main argument was that at one point, somehow mysteriously, sin came into the heart of Lucifer, who was the highest angel created by God. And Lucifer looking at himself saying, look, I'm, 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 I'm amazing. All right, pride comes before the fall. We know this expression well, the saying, well, um, he questioned not just God's character, but he questions God's ability or, or, or whether, whether he, his way is the right way. Let me put it this way, very simple. And that maybe there are some alternatives. And he even desired to take his place. Isaiah speaks very nicely about this, very clearly about this. Now, Michael and his angels were fighting the dragon. And again, it wasn't necessarily a, a physical fight with, with fists. It wasn't a fight with, with swords or nuclear weapons. It was a, a, a battle of ideas. 
And Michael, again, most scholars agree that Michael here actually represents Jesus. Some scholars from other denominations see him as another angel. But if we look through the scriptures, we will see that this theme comes up quite often. And Michael here is actually Christ. So Christ engaged the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. So we have within the Trinity, we have God the Father, we have God the Son. But right now we, we speak in these terms and we refer to Jesus as the Son because that's how we know him. He came to this earth as a baby. He uh, uh, was dependent on the Father while he was on this earth, a 100% human being, a 100% God. Philippians chapter 2 speaks about that, that he unclothed himself of his divine attributes. He didn't stop being God, but he didn't make use of it. And he remained dependent. So there was this relationship father-son, even though they're equal. So we have the Trinity. We have God involved in this battle. And for our understanding, the one who takes the armor and the one who takes the battle on is Jesus. And uh, the dragon fought back. But in verse 8, he was defeated. And I think that this is very important. So again, friends, I want to pause here. I know it gets very complicated. Some of you on this platform or listening later on uh, are familiar with some of these themes. And some of us have grown up with it. So when we say Michael, we know, ah, that's Jesus. But it's not as simple for everybody else. And if someone were to just stumble upon this lesson and listen to what we're saying, it's not we can't, it, it, we, you just can't take it for granted. That's how it is. This is the result of studying the Bible within its own context from the beginning, from Genesis to Revelation. This is why I'm saying the beauty of it is that so many of these themes are repeated within the book of Revelation and confirmed by the book of Daniel, but then they are also confirmed and uh, from different perspectives affirmed by other pass prophetic passages such as Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 in this particular case. Isaiah chapter 9, for example, speaks about the coming of the Messiah and where he was born. And you have messianic um, uh, psalms as well that speak about the coming of Christ and how he was supposed to be born for the first time when he comes to this earth in a humble state. So we need to study the scriptures uh, within its entire context. Secondly, what I want to say while we pause here is that we focus on the main themes, all right? So we're trying to explain here the main characters and the, the main idea. We started with a woman whom we said is the church, the baby who is born is the Messiah, uh, the followers of Christ are identified as his, uh, the, the woman's children, and we identify again, it's given to us in uh, the period of time, of 1,260 days, which when you compare it to the other passages, it comes to the same. The only way that it makes sense is if we contextualize it within those uh, time periods that we've referred to. Uh, now, coming to this story, so this is what happened. That's scene number one. Scene number two, we're trying to see why is this battle taking place, the first one? Oh, because something else happened before. You see, this earth, and I'm closing, uh, you know, we're, we're starting play, we're pressing play again, we're continuing the story. Looking at what's happening on this earth, we realize that there's a lot of heartache. And as one of our previous slides said, you know, there's a lot of crime and cruelty, a lot of stuff going on that doesn't, you know, it doesn't really compute when we put this against the idea of a loving God, a God who cares for us. So then, why is it that there has to be so much suffering? Why is it that when Jesus came, you know, uh, the devil, someone tried to destroy him? Why, why, why do we have battle number one? And then we come to verse seven. So it's the second battle. And we get the explanation. Everything started outside of this world. There was war in heaven. Something happened in heaven. So God in his wisdom, and in, you know, he's infinite, he, lived, he lives outside of time, he exists outside of time, but he created our world, but he created other worlds, he created angels. And even before the creation of this earth, before uh, the setting of the scene that we have right now, 
something happened there. Like with the creation of our earth, when God created it at the beginning and everything was good, you know, there was light and then there were, you know, there was the water and there was the sea and animals and fish and human beings. And God looks and everything was good. Everything was perfect until, until sin spoiled it all. The same way when everything started, whenever that is, that's beyond our understanding, it was perfect. And within the context of this perfection, there was even, you know, there are angels and there was an angel called Lucifer. We learn about him in Isaiah and he was perfect. But some, somewhere, you know, in a long time ago, in this angel's heart, a thought was born and it's a mystery. We don't know how it came to be that he challenged the authority, wisdom, character and love of God. And as he challenged that, he shared his ideas with others. And if you remember the previous passage, one third of the people believed him, began to question. Pause again. The question part, if you read Genesis chapter 3, when the woman sees the fruits, The devil, as he tempts her, he causes her to doubt. Did God really say you shouldn't eat? Do you think if you eat, you'll really die? No, actually, you know what? You are going to become like God. And that's how the devil presented his agenda that that was in his heart and that he presented to other angels who decided to join him, to, to, to Eve as well. And then she took that idea to Adam and they gave in to it. So he caused us some doubt, play again. Um, doubt came into his mind and then he began to question God, but then he began to challenge God. And this war arose in heaven. That's number seven, uh, verse seven that we've been talking about, right? Now, because in the end, God's authority came through and they were defeated, the dragon, verse 9, was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. And look how clear now, uh, how clearly the, the, the dragon is identified. The deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down where? To the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So God said, you know what? You, you, you've presented your agenda. Uh, some of the, the, the angels believed you. But now because you are not in agreement with how we do things, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, all right? You need to go. You want to continue doing things in harmony, in peace, in understanding, in love, in grace. So this is not your scene. You need to go. And someone might say, okay, but why throw him down to our earth? That's really unfair. Now, we need to understand that the two scenes, in some respects, overlap. Because what happened, it wasn't that God said, okay, you just go go to the earth, to that planet, third planet from the sun, and just mess with it and mess with people's hearts and minds and lives and do whatever you want. It wasn't like that. He was allowed to tempt other, you know, whatever, in, in my understanding, whatever other worlds that were created. But as, let's just be limited to our own reality. As he came to earth, he tempted Eve. And I believe that if Eve and Adam and Eve resisted his temptation and they said, you know what? No, I'm not. Because it wasn't just about the fruit. It was about obedience or disobedience. And if they said, no, I'll pass. I'll remain faithful to God. Then I believe God would have chased him somewhere else. All right. Or I don't know what would have happened to him. But unfortunately, unfortunately, Adam and Eve believed or gave in to his doubt. And somehow in their hearts, this idea arose that, okay, we want to be like God. They believed the devil's 
lies. And because of that, then Lucifer, the serpent, the one who uh, is called the devil and Satan, had the right to come to this planet and to present or to roll out, if you want, his plan of how life should be, right? And God could have very easily said, okay, you've rejected my authority and my rulership. I have given you an opportunity to demonstrate your loyalty to, towards me in the Garden of Eden. You've rejected that and you've believed the devil. Now you must just be on your own. Thank God he did not abandon us. And that's why even in the Garden of Eden, uh, God made the promise. God made the promise to Adam and Eve that his seed will come again, Jesus, speaking about Jesus, and that this child will crush the head of the serpent. In other, way, in, in other words, he will defeat the devil. All right? So I hope that it, it's, it's not as simple as, as it may seem that I'm trying to paint the whole picture. All right? What happened in the Garden of Eden and the fact the fall, that's what chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3 is called the fall because that happened. This gave the right to verse 9 again, the one who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver, to be thrown down to the earth. And his angel, angels were thrown down with him in the sense that now he has uh, the right to tempt, he has the right to cause chaos. Um, he, he is playing out his plan here. Jesus intervened. Jesus came. He died on our behalf defeated him not just in heaven, as we read in, in verse uh, 8 here, but he defeated him here too at the cross. All right? And now we are waiting for his second coming when evil will be destroyed forever. God is still allowing it to play itself out. But one time it, there, there will come a day when, Jesus will, when God will say enough is enough. And at his second coming, he will put an end to the rule of evil. Okay, I hope I, hope I was as clear as I could be. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser, the deceiver, the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. Uh, this is this is really really weird. And again, another book that I think another passage that we should read is the book of Job, and especially in chapter one, because Job chapter one somehow pulls the curtain aside, and we see exactly what happens. You see, Adam was supposed to be the representative of humanity before God together with the unfallen worlds, all right? And whenever there was, like in Job, it speaks about the council of God's sons that came together. Those who have been created by God, all right? Those representing different worlds. And there we have the devil. Why is he there? Because he was chased out of, of heaven. Well, he was there by means of representing the earth. And, G and, and God still says, in, I'm speaking about jo uh, Job, chapter one, have you seen my servant Job? Even though you have authority over, over that, that world and you think you do, <laughs> there are still people faithful to me. And then the devil says, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I know Job. Uh, he's faithful to you because you bless him. But, you know, just let me, let me mess, mess with him a little bit and you'll see how he is going to, he's not going to follow you anymore. He's not going to be a follower of yours. And that's when uh, God says, okay, I will allow you to mess with him. Just I'm not allowing you to take his life. And there we see how actually it is not God causing all the bad things that are happening to Job. It is the devil trying to take him away from God. Even Job himself couldn't really understand that there's someone else behind this because at one point he says, God has given, God has taken away. He still sees God as the one taking away. But regardless, I will remain faithful to him. So 
The devil is defeated in, in the case of Job and God blesses him double of all the blessings that he'd had before. And uh, that, there's a powerful lesson there. There's a powerful lesson that how, how uh, the devil's business is, you know, to cause us to do wrong and, and then go and accuse. I'm coming back to verse 10 for the accuser of our brothers to go and accuse us before God and say, you see what Dan did? Did you see what he thought and the acts that, well, he can't really read our minds, but did you see how he speaks and how he behaves? And he's not, he's not your child. And he cannot wait to accuse us. Many times and many people see God as being capricious. And they see God as just waiting for us to do something wrong so that he can punish us. That's not God. That's not God at all. That is actually the modus operandi of the devil. He is the one instigating things. I don't know if you've had, you know, when, when, I, was, when I was a kid in school, you know, I remember this, this particular boy. Uh, man, he, he, he would be, I don't know. I mean, I think he, had, he was very, very um, mature from an emo, uh, emotional standpoint. You know, he's emotional intelligence was very high because he had this very um, mischievous ability to make you say or do something, dare you to do something bad. And then you did it. You know, I, I don't think you can, you can smash that window, you know, with this little stone. No, I, I don't think you can. I, you can't throw that far. So, oh, wow, I'm talking about I can throw far. No, no, you can't do it. And then you would want to show me, I can, bang, smash the window. You'd be the first one to run to the principal and tell him, oh, look, Dan, smash that window. And that would be so annoying. I mean, man, you know, we, we, we were in this together. What are you doing? That's exactly how the devil operates. He tempts us. He instigates us. And then he's the first one to go and say, you see, He's not your child. He still gets angry with you when he doesn't understand certain things. He is still impatient with his brothers and sisters and all kinds of things. After causing it to happen, then he is the one who accuses us. Verse 11, and they have conquered him. How was the devil conquered? By the blood of the Lamb. And this is, again, beautiful imagery. We read about the Lamb of God, and we read about the sacrificing of the lambs, even from the Garden of Eden. As soon as Adam and Eve committed sin, they were called to sacrifice. Just try to imagine, they've never seen death before. And Adam, with his own hand, to kill another being, you know, an innocent animal. And then God saying, okay, that lamb, represents the one who is going to come, the Lamb of God, the one who is going to come and who I, he's going to be without sin, but who is going to take your sin upon himself and pay the penalty of death so that you, Adam and Eve, can live eternally. All right? So they were conquered. They were defeated by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So this is a powerful lesson here. Again, going to the previous passage here where we read about the 1,260 days. Those are days in which, you know, many people were martyrs and they did not love their lives more than being loyal to God. You know, and I, I think about, you know, various places around the world where there's conflict and where people are dying for, for, a, for a, you know, a piece of land just because that, they believe that's my land. That's my ancestral land. That's my country. And it's worth, you know, putting my, my life on the line. There are people who die for, for, for great causes. There are people who die for stupid causes. All right? That to be able to have that kind of faith and loyalty and dedication and commitment to God's word. And when someone says, you know, I want you to worship this. And for them to say, no, I can't. I only worship God. We'll kill you if you don't. Well, do whatever you want. My life is not more precious than my conviction. And I know that God, in the end, will give me eternal life. 
that, that's, that's quite something. Therefore, so now against the background of everything that we've discussed, these two major battles that outline the great controversy between good and evil, the great, the great conflict, the message here is rejoice, O oh, heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So there's the point of heaven has been sorted out. There is reason to, to rejoice. But as far as the earth is concerned, our reality here, we need to be very much conscious of the fact or aware of the fact that we're still in the midst of the battle. The good news here is that his time is short. And to us, it may not seem as short. You know, there have been thousands of years since evil has come into the world. But uh, you know what? Within the bigger scheme of things and against eternity, this will be a very short time. That's one aspect of this uh, um, statement. And then there is another one. His time is short in the sense that there isn't, there is not long, uh, there isn't going to be any, uh, the, the time is not long until this will come to, to an end, until, until Jesus Christ will come again and put an end to it all. Within the next few minutes, we've got only a few minutes left. Let's read uh, verses 13 uh, to 17. These are the last verses of Revelation 12. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Now, I think that now as we read this sentence, it makes more sense to us because of everything that we've said before. Who is the woman? Right, say the church. Now, because he was defeated in his purposes, now he's enraged against those who follow Christ, right? So he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Male child, that's Jesus. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle. And this is a reference to, you know, when Jesus, when, when God um, rescued, if you want, the Israelites from Egypt. And whenever God steps in, there were certain periods in the, in the history of Israel when he stepped in, there's this imagery that is given, you know, that they, they were taken by wings of, of eagle, of the eagle. That's, that's a imagery of victory. All right, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time, again, reference to that time period. And even though it was in the wilderness, even though it was hard, even, even though there was persecution, God took care of his church. God took care of those who desired to remain faithful. Serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with flood, but the earth came to, to, to the help. And again, here is about destruction. There is symbolism by, by flood, you know, trying to destroy um, the woman, the church. But she was rescued, came, helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. There's a lot of symbolism there. Unfortunately, we don't have time. Again, as it was said last, weekend, uh, last week, please make sure that you read more on this and that you familiarize yourself with some of the aspects that we don't have time to cover tonight. I want to focus on, on verse 17 because I think it is important. Then the dragon became furious with the woman. And went off to make war on the re uh, to make war on the rest of her offspring, and now this is right at the end of the end time. All right, so he's tried to destroy the child, the coming of Jesus Christ, time of Herod didn't work. All right, then during the persecution, there were centuries that we're talking about here almost a millennium, and he was enraged. And he wanted to, to really, really destroy the church. He didn't manage to. Then we have the period of Reformation, and we have the time when the Bible, you know, the two witnesses come to the front, and yeah, they try to destroy it, but they don't manage. This wasn't the period before that. And there's, you know, a great awakening, and, and uh, seemingly something good is happening. 
and that makes the dragon furious, right? So he decides to go and make war on the rest of her offspring. Now, the rest of her offspring can also be described, the rest of, as the remnant. And throughout the history of, the, of, 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 the, of, of humanity, you have always a remnant that has, has been faithful to God. You know, even if we were to think of Noah and his family, they were a remnant. And throughout the history of Christianity in particular, there's always a remnant. You know, things happen, but then there's a, there are a faithful few that grow that remain faithful to God. So in the end time, what will this remnant be defined by? And there are two things here that stand out. And by the way, it's not necessarily a church per se, but it's easy to identify a group of believers uh, with these two things. Those who keep the commandments of God, right? So a, an emphasis, a focus on the importance of the commandments of God, some of the forgotten commandments like uh, the seventh, uh, seventh day worship, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And the testimony of Jesus, what that means is um, found in Revelation 19 verse 10, that's where it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And we don't necessarily have much time tonight to go into that, but I'd like you to just remember it, okay? So those who keep the commandments of God and those who have uh, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So that's how it ends. And then that we were going to make our way into the next, into the next chapter, Revelation chapter 13. Uh, friends, again, you know, every time that I present a lesson like this, uh, I am a little bit frustrated that uh, it's not necessarily that we are limited by time, but that we are not in person to be able to open the Bible and listen to questions and be able to address some of the questions. But uh, this is an overview. This is not necessarily a, it's a presentation um, on speed dial, <laughs> very quickly going through it and highlighting the main aspects, right? The woman, what she represents, the dragon, what he represents, there's conflict, good and evil. There's a child, a male child, oh, there's Jesus. And then the devil tries to destroy, to destroy the child, he doesn't manage to. He tries to destroy the woman, he doesn't manage to. He tries to destroy the offspring of the woman, the followers of Jesus. And what we are told is that he's not going to be able to. And even though throughout the history of, of the Christian church, people have lost their lives, were martyred for their faith, in the end, God wins. And this is the good news.